but soon after that, we'll start the book of Titus. So that's kind of where we're going. But last week, we started a message called Happy to Give. Now, I know we're just a week out from Christmas, and people would, might be asking, what's this got to do with Christmas? Well, in some ways, nothing directly, but in many ways, very much indirectly. Because in this passage where Paul is arguing that the Christians need to give generously, he gives one of the motivations for that. For, for we know that through the grace of God, that though our Lord Jesus was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Tell me that's about Christmas. It is. And, and, and he's using that event of the poverty, the incarnation, the humility of Jesus Christ to motivate them to give. And so we're not that far away from a Christmas message. And we're in a series called Total Grace. And this is the grace I've called sacrificing grace or grace giving. So let's stand in honor of God's word. Second Corinthians 8. We're looking at actually chapter 8 and 9. We're hop skipping and jumping across two chapters. But I want to just get our bearings by reading the first seven verses. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says this, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Question, what grace? The grace of giving. You may be seated. Several years ago, I heard the great Baptist preacher and my favorite preacher, Adrian Rogers, tell the story of a traveling circus. And as part of the evening show, a, a strong man would appear and do astonishing feats of physical strength. In fact, as part of his act, the concluding part of his act, he would often crush an orange to the point that there was no juice left in it. He would crush it dry. And then at the end of his act, he would also challenge anyone in the audience to come forward and see if they could squeeze one more drop from the crushed fruit. Well, it had gone on in many, many places, and no one had ever taken up his challenge. But he gets to a particular town, and in that evening, a skinny, scrawny old man comes forward at the end of his act. And as people look at this skinny, scrawny old man, you know, they, they begin to laugh, and sniggers begin to ripple across the circus crowd. But undaunted, he marches forward, he grabs that piece of fruit, he puts it in his right hand, and he proceeds to squeeze one more drop of orange juice from it. The, the, the crowd goes wild, cheering and clapping. The, the, the strong man can't believe what his eyes have just seen, flabbergasted. And as the old man's about to turn and return to his seat, the strong man asks them, before you go, who are you and what do you do? To which he replies, my name is Fred, and I'm the treasurer from the local Baptist church. <laughs> you got to hear Adrian Rogers tell that story. But joking aside, it is a sad fact, is it not? that God's people, when it comes to giving, often need to be squeezed, goaded, even manipulated into giving to God's work. And that ought not to be the case. Our giving ought to be free, not forced. It ought to be a matter of grace, not guilt. It ought to be something desired by us, not something demanded from us. That ought to be the case. And as we come back to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we're going to be helped to that end because here Paul encourages the grace of giving. Giving that's free, not forced. Giving that's desired by us, not demanded from us. 
because here Paul extols the grace of giving. If you look at verse 1, he talks about the grace of God that was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, how in their poverty they give liberally. Their giving was the result of God's grace at work in their life. In fact, Paul encourages the Corinthians to follow the Macedonians' example, and he says in verse um, 6 that indeed that they would complete this grace, that is, that they would complete the promise they had made to give to the collection to the poor saints in Jerusalem. He wants them to extol, or sorry, to excel in this grace of giving, that they might abound in this grace, verse 7. The motivation for their grace giving is the grace giving of God. For we know, verse 9, the grace of the Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. In fact, he'll say in chapter 9 and verse 8 that the grace of God can produce this good work of grace giving. Because he says the grace of God is able to abound toward you And it's able to make all grace abound towards you and all things having all sufficiency that you may abound in every good work. And just uh, as he kind of signs off in verses 14 and 15, he'll talk about the exceeding grace of God in them. So, So giving ought not to be a matter of guilt. It ought to be a matter of grace. It ought to be free, not forced. It ought to be something we desire to do rather than be demanded from us because God has been gracious to us. And the grace of God through Jesus Christ and the grace of God in us because of Jesus Christ produces this generous expression of giving to God's work. That's where we were last week. We, we saw that um, our giving is a reflex to God's giving. And so we started to look at this wonderful passage. And we said that we're going to move along under four headings. The motives of grace giving, the manner of grace giving, the multiplication of grace giving, and the message of grace giving. And remember, we're in a series on the grace of God. Total grace. That's how one ought to describe the Christian life. We're saved by grace. We're empowered by grace. We're supplied by grace. We're prompted by grace to give graciously. Grace will land us in heaven and grace will continue to bless us throughout all of eternity. And we have looked at saving grace, strengthening grace, serving grace, speaking grace, sharing grace, singing grace. And now we're looking at sacrificing grace. The ability to give sacrificially to God's word, work, that will be prompted by grace. The manner of it, we started to look at last week. Now, we saw the motives for it. God's glory, the gospel, and a love for God's people. But what about the manner of it? Having answered why we ought to give, we started to answer how we ought to give. And I'll just regurgitate the first thought, and then we'll get going this morning Grace giving is costly. That's what we said last week. That's the first thing that comes out of these passages. Grace giving is costly. We saw that in verses 1 to 4. How out of a great trial of affliction and out of an abundance of joy and out of deep poverty, the Macedonians gave liberally and richly and generously at a cost for the collection of the saints in Jerusalem. Remember, the backdrop to this is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4, where Paul had encouraged them to to, um, gather a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem and Judea who were facing famine and persecution. Many had been disinherited by their families because of their faith in Christ. And so the Macedonians rise to the challenge And in the light of that, Paul encourages the Corinthians to do the same. He wants to see this same grace at work in them. He wants to see them give generously. He wants to see them reach down deep and give liberally. Now, we noticed, didn't we, this little phrase in verse 3, for I bear witness that according to their, uh, their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency to receive the gift. And we saw that there were three levels of giving. 
There's giving that's beneath your ability. There's giving that's according to your ability. And there's giving that's beyond your ability. You'll see that the Macedonians fell into the second and third category. They didn't give beneath their ability. They weren't chintzy. They weren't cheap. No, they dug down deep. They gave the most when they had the least. They give according to their ability. What they give represented kind of what they were able to give, and there was a marked generosity with it. In fact, Paul says, not only did they give to their ability, notice verse 3, yes and beyond. They give till it hurt. Or as we quoted Adrian Rogers last week again, don't give till it hurts, give till it feels good. And they felt good about helping the saints in Jerusalem, and they gave generously. And yet, you know what? The the statistics today show that the average Protestant evangelical gives only 3% of their giving. That's pitiful. That's beneath our ability. We're not close to matching what's going on here in the early church. We're giving beneath our ability when they give according to their ability and, yes, beyond their ability. We're making contributions, but we're not making sacrifices. Reminds me of the story between uh, the debate between the, the chicken and the pig as to who served man the most. When it came to breakfast, the chicken argued, you know what, I make, I, I make man happy. I give him two eggs every morning for his breakfast. The pig says, well, you might give him some eggs, but I give him a nice slice of, of bacon, hearty, heartwarming. And the pig then kind of, you know, uh, takes the chicken down with this statement, what you give him is a contribution, what I give him is a sacrifice. All right? Because you can give an egg and still stay alive if you're a chicken. You can't give a piece of bacon and remain a pig. But I wonder how many times could we say that about Christians. They make a contribution, but they don't make a sacrifice. Not true of the Macedonians and Paul prays. It's not true of the Corinthians. So we're caught up. Let's move on. Here's the second aspect of the manner of grace giving. Grace giving is consecrated. Don't miss this. Grace giving is consecrated. I want you to understand this, that the act of giving money to the church or finances to missions, the act of giving is always predicated by another act of giving. That's Paul's argument in verse 5. Look at chapter 8 and verse 5. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul's taking a step back. He's celebrating the fact that they give out of their poverty with joy liberally to the saints at Jerusalem. But he now takes a step back. You need to understand that before they give themselves to us and before they give the collection to the saints, they first give themselves to the Lord and that's the secret of their giving. Grace giving is not only costly, it's consecrated. Grace giving is always the byproduct of a consecrated life given in full surrender to Jesus Christ. They first give themselves to the Lord. It would be Romans 12, 1 and 2. They presented their body as a living sacrifice. See, generous giving is always the outworking of a life submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because a life submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a life that has surrendered to Jesus Christ all that they are and all that they have. All that they are and all that they have. And when you're surrendered in that manner, spontaneous sacrificial giving is easy. It's not a fight. It's not a debate. Because if you've first given yourself to the Lord and everything you have is His, then You'll give what is his to those he asked you to give to. I think when it comes to this idea of Christian stewardship, we have tended to limit it to the idea of raising money or giving money. You know, you've heard of stewardship campaigns. But you need to understand the idea of being a steward, a a manager, someone that looks after something for another, that Christian stewardship takes in all of life. Old preachers have said it, and I'm going to repeat it. God owns all of our time and all of our treasure and all of our talents. We've got to dedicate that all to the Lord. How we spend our days, how we spend our money, and how we spend our energy and our gifts. And if stewardship encompasses all of life, 
If you're submitted to Jesus Christ, head to toe, then your pocket's included. And that's what Paul's arguing here. They first give themselves to the Lord. See, money is merely an extension of ourselves. And if we have first given ourselves to the Lord, the giving of money as an extension of ourselves is easy. I I like what... um, James Carter says, dedication to God is the key to Christian stewardship. This assures us that the decision for giving has already been made. If one has dedicated his life to Christ, some decisions do not have to be made anew each time when issues arise. The decision has already been made. The Christian should not have to fight the battle over whether he will cheat, gamble, be unfaithful to his spouse, lie, steal, or live without personal integrity. These decisions should have already been made when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. His point, when you make the one decision submitted to Christ, then the other decisions are easy. Submission to Christ means you'll be faithful to your wife. You'll be honest in your dealings. Your life will be marked by integrity, and you'll be generous in your giving. Because though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty may be made rich. If that's what he is to us, and he's in us, making us like him, that stuff comes naturally. The one decision leads to the other decisions, which are not really that hard a decision. Uh, let me illustrate this and move on. I remember years ago reading the story of James Culvert, who was a missionary to the cannibals in the Fiji Islands. God called him to go there. The whole f- enterprise was fraught with danger. As you can imagine, he passed passage on a ship. There are several people with him. They just come off the coast of the Fiji Islands, and the captain tries to talk them out of it. He says, this is nuts. This is a suicide mission. You, you, you step off this boat onto that beach, you're probably going to die. And here's what James Calvert said to that captain. We died before we came here. We died before we came here. He died to self. He took up his cross. When you make make that decision back in the UK, you can make the decision to step onto the beach of hostile territory because that decision helps you with that decision. We died before we came here. And when giving comes around and you have to decide how much and in what manner, That's not a hard decision for someone that's first given themselves to the Lord. So let's move on. Thirdly, grace giving is complete. Grace giving is complete. It's a promise made and it's a promise kept. That's one of the themes that comes out of 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. As I said, we paint in the background about a year earlier. You know, promises had been made prompted by Paul or perhaps Titus's visit. A collection was to be taken to relieve the emergency and stress on the poor believers in Jerusalem and Judea. And so a year earlier, they had, they had indicated that it was their intention to indeed jump in both feet and help the saints out. And now Paul writes and says, hey, we need to complete this. We need to do what we said we would do. Let me show you his thinking here. Look at verse 6 of chapter 8. We urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Collection had been taken among the churches in Macedonia, and they gave liberally out of their poverty. Now Titus is with the Corinthians, and it's their opportunity to complete What was begun a year earlier, it's now time to give, to follow through on the good intention. Uh, You you see that again uh, uh, elsewhere in in the passage. Look at uh, chapter 9 and verse 2, where he talks about how um, a year ago they they were zealous uh, and and, and wishing and willing to give and, and now it's time for that gift to be taken and to be carefully handled and, and brought to Jerusalem. 
Look at verse 5, especially of chapter 9. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that may be ready as a matter of generosity. In fact, if you go back, sorry, to chapter 8 and verse 10 and 11, you'll see this word complete or completion appear once again. It appears in verse 6. And then we read in verse 11, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That is the doing of what you promised a year ago. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of it. I know you were moved. I know that you you desire. I know that your intention, but now your good intentions have to become concrete actions and complete what you promised. Look, folks, it's a very simple thought, but we don't want to. We don't want to miss it. We, when it comes to giving, we've got to follow through on our intentions. When we're moved, when we're stirred, and it's of God, and we know there's a need to be met, and we can meet that need because God has met our need abundantly. Then follow through. You know what is. Ecclesiastes 5, 1, and 1 to 5 warn us, when you make a vow to God, make sure you pay it. It's better not to vow, not to promise, and not follow through. So that's what we've got here. Actions need to speak louder than words. The collection's got to be taken, and the promise has got to be made and fulfilled. We've got to walk the talk, folks. We've got to do what we say when it comes to giving. Because time will go by. Feelings will fade. Resolve will collapse. Things will get in the way. And we will fail to fulfill our promises to God. Whether it's a pledge to church or a ministry or missions. Good intentions achieve nothing by themselves. That's why it's been well said, God save us from people who mean well. So, so make sure that um, you follow through, that you complete what you've promised. Don't uh, make a half-hearted commitment, make a whole-hearted commitment and make sure you wholly fulfill it. I like the story I came across in a book, The American Spirit, written by David McCullough, a great writer, has written several bios on great Americans. This was a compilation of essays and lectures that he gave at the Naval Academy, at the Congress, um, at the Senate, at the Congress, the Library of Congress. Great lectures on America's history, America's beginnings, America's founding fa- uh, fathers. And in this particular chapter I was reading, he, he talks about how the presidency kind of comes of age under Theodore Re- Roosevelt, where, where America kind of, in ways that it had never done before, steps onto the world stage and, 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 and embraces its role among the nations. And the president is seen in some ways for the first time as a world leader. And Roosevelt kind of reinforces that. He, he, um, he's the driving force behind the Panama Canal. He's a larger-than-life figure. He's the one that officially calls the White House the White House. He was the first president to get on an airplane. He was the first president to go down in a submarine. And one of the stories I like the most about him and this kind of promoting of the presidency and, and this kind of displaying of American power comes from that he decides to show Americans, America's power on the sea, and he wants to send the Navy around the world just to kind of go from city to city and country to country showing America's power in its naval might. He had, ha- he had enough money to get them halfway there, but not enough money to bring them back. But being the kind of man that he was, he decided, given the fact that Congress indicated they were unwilling to give him the rest of the money, he just launched the ships anyway. He, he figured if he could get them halfway around the world, the Congress would have to bring them the other half. We're not going to leave the American Navy in Constantinople. 
We've got to bring the boys home. And he kind of forced their hand. I'm going to get them halfway around and you guys are going to get them the other half. And he kind of forced the hand of the Congress. He said, Theodore Roosevelt is becoming, to me, one of the most interesting of the American presidents. But the point of my story, taking his story, is the Navy's got to come home. You can't leave them halfway around the world. We've got to complete this tour. I financed half of it, and you guys are going to finance the other half, whether you like it or not. Complete it. And that's kind of Paul's argument here. You know, we're halfway into this. You've, 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 you've been moved to help the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, you've, you've made pledges and promises. Titus has come, and uh, now it's time to complete this thing. Now it's time to come full circle. Here's another thought about grace giving. Grace giving is considered. It's thoughtful. It, 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 it's um, reflected upon. Grace giving is considered. It's not just thorough in its complete. It's thoughtful in its considered. It's not a spur of the moment thing. It's not an emotional thing. It's calculated. It's considered. It's planned. It's thought out. Grace giving is not left to chance. It's not left to feelings. It's not left to circumstances. No, uh, grace giving is the product of prayer and meditation and thought. Let me show you this. Look at chapter 9 and verse 7. As I said, we're skipping and jumping across this passage. Here's what Paul says. So let each one give us, notice these words, he purposes in his heart. The giving is purposeful, it's thoughtful, it's, it's planned, it's thought out. As he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. In fact, let's go back to the passage that kind of launches these two passages. Back in the first letter, in chapter 16, now concerning the collection for the saints, parenthesis in Jerusalem, as has as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so must, do, must, so must you do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up, as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. Again, it sounds like a deliberate act, doesn't it? As the weekend approaches, you folks in Corinth, I want you to think about how much you're going to set aside and store up for the collection. So we see in both those verses this idea of um, premeditation and purpose. Premeditation and purpose. Not whim, not emotion, not the moment. Premeditation and purpose. In fact, um, this passage in 1 Corinthians 16, 1-4 is a kind of an echo of the Old Testament in the sense, if you study the Old Testament, the believer under the Old Covenant gave systematically and regularly because giving in the Old Testament was attached to holidays and festivals, whether Passover, um, you know, where they celebrated the, their deliverance from, the, from, from Egypt and the Exodus or the Feast of the Tabernacles or you know, the Feast of First Fruits, at different times of the year, the Jewish believer went up with their tithes and offerings to God's house. It wasn't left a chance. There was a date, there was a day, and there was an amount. You went up to Jerusalem, and you celebrated with the nation. Now, we're going to see in a moment that tithing is not commanded in the New Testament. And, and there's kind of this decentralizing of faith in the New Testament where instead of God having a temple for his people, he has a people for his temple and they're spread out all over the world. It's not located. It's not even confined to one nation. But it doesn't mean there's nothing systematic about the church. And I think even here Paul's going, hey, you know what? The Jewish believer had a sat time where they gave and they did it in the light of God's redemption and work in their life, I suggest on the first day of the week, Christians should set aside an amount to support the gospel or relieve the saints. 
And they ought to do it, I'd say, the first day of the week's the best day. Why? Because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. That will remind you of the gospel and the liberty that you have. In the light of God's grace and in the light of the liberty you have in Christ, you ought to give graciously and liberally to God's work. I'm just saying, folks, that grace is Grace giving is considered. It's thoughtful. It's planned. It's not left to, to, to whim. It's laid aside purposefully. That's why I'd, I'd say this to you. Don't wait to give until you're begged to do so. Don't wait to give until you've paid all your bills and you see what's left to give to the Lord. Don't wait to the end of the year to do all your giving because you generally will give less than you would if you give every week or every month. Don't wait until others give and they prompt you to give. Don't wait till the church's budget gets behind. Don't wait until you have enough money. No, no, give in a considered, thoughtful, systematic, regularly planned manner. That's the biblical way. That's what you do with grace giving. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin? who said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And you need to plan your giving. Be considerate. Left to whim and intuition, very few things in life get done and get done well. And it's the same in the Christian life and it's the same with giving. So, grace giving is costly, consecrated, complete, considered. A couple more and we'll wrap this up. In fact, I got the folks out a little early in first service, so miracles will never cease. <laughs> you, that just may be your hope this morning. Here's, the, here's another thought. Grace giving is collective. Grace giving is collective. What do I mean by that? We're kind of picking up on the point I made last week. What are the motives the praise of God, the poverty of God in Christ, and the people of God. Well, I want to return to this idea that giving to God's work is an expression of a sense of family and, and, and solidarity with the saints. We, we saw that especially when Paul is, is celebrating and bearing witness to the generosity of the Macedonians, and, and he wants us to know, you know what, they were begging us to take the collection begging us to take the collection. Look at verse 4. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift. That's the gift for the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. Now, notice what he says. The gift. And here's another motive. And the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. They, they didn't give in a detached manner. They, they gave out of a heart that was bursting for love for God's people with a sense of ownership of the church and the importance of the church in the life of God's people. And although they were separated by miles and they were faces they had never seen and saints they had never met, they had such a love for the church, they had such a big view of God's kingdom that the saints in Macedonia said, Paul, we're begging you, take the gift. Take the gift. And we want you to take the gift because it's a, it's a demonstration of the fellowship, the partnership, the koinonia, the oneness that we feel with the saints of God. So, so you and I, when we give, when we write a check, when we swipe our card, we drop something in the boxes on the way out this morning, you must never see that as something that you're doing in isolation from others. In fact, your motive ought to be that this gift will bless others and support others and bring the gospel to others. We all cannot give the same, but we all must give. And we all must give out of a sense of solidarity with the saints of God. It, giving is, is an individual act in, in a sense, but it's a corporate act also. And there's two little aspects to this I'll just drill down into quickly. It requires full participation. It is collective. It's by the saints, for the saints. By the saints, for the saints. And I want you to notice that everybody should be involved. Look at chapter 9 and verse 7 again, where Paul says this, So let each one of you, so let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart. Again, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, you get an, a similar thought. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside. That means mothers and fathers. 
husbands and wives, parents and children, young and old, those who have just come to faith and are new in the faith, and those who are many years along the path of discipleship and are mature in the faith. That means the married, that means the single. That means those who have much and those who have little. Let each of you purpose in his heart, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And there's another thing here. Not only is is this universal obligation, this privilege of full participation, there's there's an aspect of reciprocity. There's this sense that we belong to each other. And you know what? At this moment in history, The believers, the Greek believers, the Gentile believers in Macedonia and Corinth are giving to the poor believers in Jerusalem, mostly Jewish. And there's this sense of unity. And the one part of the body is helping another part of the body. Not just locally, but globally. And Paul is saying, you know what, that's where we're at now. But I can envision a day. Just say the tables turn. And there comes a point where the Jewish believers get through this and the church in Jerusalem begins to prosper. And then the ill wind of change comes and something happens and the believers in Macedonia struggle in a future day. I'd like to believe that the tables can be turned. And someday the the, the believers who are now being helped in Jerusalem from Macedonia will help the believers in Macedonia from Jerusalem. Paul actually argues that. I'll give you the verses. Verses 13 through 15. Notice what he says, chapter 8. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack or their need, and that someday, parenthesis, that their abundance may supply your lack, that there may be equality, that the body looking after itself, that Christians across the world think about Christians across the world and give generously. And you know what? In God's providence, you'll find that when you invest in others, there's a sweetness that someday they just turn around and invest in you. And there's this reciprocity, there's this equality, there's this unity that marks the people of God. I was fascinated and struck to learn that it's, it stories emerged out of the Holocaust, that those who survived in the Nazi death camps had an attitude of determined giving. Let me explain, as someone explained to me. Those who survived were were more likely to be the kind of prisoner who, on the verge of starvation, still gave a crust of bread to a fellow prisoner, gave a sip of water to a fellow prisoner, gave a scrap of potato to a fellow prisoner. And and as that unfolded, the person that did that was more likely psychologically and spiritually to survive because they were a giver. And often that giving also came back to them. A survivor of Treblinka described it this way, in our group we shared everything. And the moment one of the group ate something without sharing it, we knew it was the beginning of the end for him. There's that thought of reciprocity. It's a principle in life, and it's a principle of, of, of giving also. Okay, two more. I think we're on course to get you out early. Grace giving is commensurate. Grace giving is commensurate. This is, again, under the manner of grace giving. What do I mean by that? It's, it's commensurate to your income. It's commensurate to your income. Now, here's something I want you to think about. In the New Testament, when it relates to giving, we move from percentage to proportion. Very important you get this. We move from percentage to proportion. What do I mean by that? Well, when you go back to the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the Jewish believer, their giving was tithe-based. You know that, tithe-based. A tithe was a, a one-tenth of their income. And it's interesting, when you go to Malachi chapter 3, they didn't just give one tithe, they give several tithes. That's why Malachi says, bring your tithes, plural, and offerings into the storehouse and see if God won't open the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. In fact, uh, commentators and New Testament scholars tell us that when you combine several of the tithes that we find in the New Testament, 
that on, on average, the Jewish believer on an annual basis gave 33% of their income. Now, remember, they weren't just giving to the temple, but they were giving to the administration of the government, to kings, to the upkeep of the military. So, in a sense, back in the Old Testament, it was a combination of what we would call kind of taxes to the government and giving to the Lord's work. That aside, the point I want you to realize that in the Old Testament, their giving was defined. Although beyond that, they could give free will offerings that would go beyond that. It's not like that was it. It, it could be more than it. But when we get to the New Testament, there is not a command anywhere in the New Testament that you and I need to tithe. Now, some would argue it's just assumed, and, and grace doesn't produce anything less than the law. I, 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 you know, I can embrace that. I, I'm, I'm not saying you have to, but I've always kind of operated, June and I have always kind of operated on the basis that a, a tithe is a good place to start. It's the floor rather than the ceiling as Stephen Alford says. But, but the point is this. In the New Testament, it's, it's freer than that. It's give according to as the Lord has prospered you or according to your ability. It's not a percentage. It's a proportion. God expects to give you to give a proportion of every wage packet to Him in the light of the cross, in the light of His goodness and mercy, in the light of His lavish love. Now, that's challenging. That's challenging. I, I, you, get, you ever get the impression from people that grace makes it easier? No, I think grace makes it more responsible and more responsive. And the point is, okay, I'm not going to give you a percentage, says God, but you're going to come up with that percentage in the light of my prospering you. That's a challenge. Now, let me root it in the text to make an application. Look at chapter 8 and verse 3 concerning the, the, the Macedonians. And notice, they give according to their ability. Nothing there about a percentage. Nothing there about a designated amount. They give according to their ability. In fact, they just didn't stop there. They give beyond their ability. They give when it didn't make sense. They give when, this, when the numbers did not up. Powerful. Scroll down to verses 11 and 12. And you'll, you'll pick up this, this idea, verse 12 especially, that they are to give according to what one has. Again, it's according to, it's in the light of your ability, it's in the light of what God has given you. Again, similar thought in chapter 9, verses 8 through uh, 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 um, 11. We're, we're, again, they're, they're to kind of uh, give uh, as God has prospered them. Uh, and as they have been enriched in everything, they're to give liberally, verse 11. So, so giving is to be commensurate. It's not to be a percentage, it's to be a proportion. You, you get a similar thought, actually, just to take us outside the Corinthian letters. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 29, uh, we read of a, a relief again for the brothers in Jerusalem and in Judea, then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren. It's according to one's ability. But I want to tell you this before we go any further. Generosity is the outcome. Generosity is the outcome. Whatever that amount is that you decide, it will always kind of work out to be generous, not stingy, not calculating and miserly, because that's what happens here. I mean, the, the Macedonians give liberally out of their poverty according to their ability. Similar thought, chapter 9, verse 5, where Paul expects that whatever the Corinthians are going to give is going to be a matter of generosity. So whatever the amount is, it will be a matter of generosity. Because that gift will be given in the light of God's generosity. And how can God's generosity not prompt our generosity? You get the logic? Because I think some people think since there is no percentage, that they can use that as a backdoor to escape financial obligations. But as I said, grace doesn't produce anything less than the law. God's prospering of us will lead us 
to indeed be generous, to not be enslaved to our stuff, not allow our souls to be knit to this old world. In fact, you know from 1 Timothy 6 verse 18, Paul says, to those who are rich, you need to be rich in good works. When God enriches us, it's not to feather our nest. It's not for you and I to live in luxury, although the Bible is not against material prospering. I think there's a rhythm in the Bible between feasting and fasting. We can enjoy material things at some points in our life. We're not called to austerity anywhere that I see in the Bible. But at the same time, you've got to be careful that that prospering, that material wealth doesn't lead to me, my, and mine only. Where we so spend our money and we lose sight of the eternal and the spiritual, there ought to be not only times of feasting, but fasting. When we uh, not only give according to our ability, but beyond our ability. And if we're going to give beyond our ability, we're not going to buy some stuff that's nice, but not necessary. And you know what? You're going to have to be mature about that. Don't get all monastical. You know? And, you know, and where all your furniture are, are, you know, cardboard boxes. But on the other hand, while you embrace God's kindness, be wary of materialism and make sure you're giving according to how God has prospered you. Yes, He has given you all things to enjoy, but He has also given you money to be rich in good works. And by the way, I think every one of us this morning, given what we have and the way we live, would be considered rich in the New Testament. In fact, I think C.S. Lewis is, is helpful here, probably answers best the question for us. What is the question? Just how much should I give? Because, Pastor, you haven't given me a percentage. That would be easy. I'd, I'd know what to shoot for. Uh, no, you see, it's to be a hard issue. It's to be an expression of what God's doing in your life through the gospel. That's, that's what we're going to find out in your giving. So, so how much is, is enough or how much should it be? Let's listen to C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. This is good. I do not believe one should settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe way is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements is up to the standard common among those with the same income as ours, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they, our expenditures, are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charities expenditure excludes them. That's good. That's, that's, that's helpful. He's being practical. He's just saying, hey, I'm not going to give you a mind. I'm not even sure what that amount is. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to err on the side of generosity. I'm going to make sure as I look back on the year that has passed, were there things I was going to do that I didn't do because I wanted to give not only according to my ability but beyond my ability? Have I felt, ever felt the pinch of giving by grace? Because if I haven't felt the pinch and if I haven't given some things up, I'm probably not giving what I ought to in the light of God's prospering of me. That's a good word. Because you see, um, our giving ought to be cheerful. That's the last thought this morning. Grace giving is cheerful. Commensurate and cheerful. Life touched and transformed by the grace of God is a life that finds giving a happy experience. <laughs> when you write the check, when you swipe the card, when you put something in the box, is it a happy experience? Or are you having second thoughts? <laughs> Not sure I can afford that, but here it goes. You know, it's, some, it's what Christians do. Um, you know, or, or is it, hey, I'm, 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 I'm so blessed and this is happy experience. It's a way for me to just show in tangible ways God's goodness and mercy to me. I know this is going to support the gospel, going to help our pastors, going to support our missionaries, going to be the upkeep of the buildings so that we're not embarrassed to bring people on the property. All of that. Go, go to chapter 9 and verse 7. We read it earlier, but this is where my thought comes from. So let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, out of, nor in, out of necessity, 
For God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word there gives us our English word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver, a happy giver. That's why, by the way, throughout this chapter, the words, the word freely and willingly will, give, will come up again and again. Because if you're a happy giver, you're going to give willingly and, and freely. Let me give you a couple of verses as we kind of move towards the close. Verse 12, he talks about first a willing mind concerning the Corinthians. Again, verse 19, uh, he, he talks about uh, a ready mind that's willing to give to this collection to the glory of the Lord himself. In, in verse 2, he talks, for I know your willingness of chapter 9. Verse 5 of chapter 9, again, he talks about um, the, the, that their giving is a, is a matter of, of generosity and, and um, you know, something that they were willing to do. It's not going to be something that is a grudging obligation. And then finally, ver verse um, 7 be cheerful. The Lord loves that. Do you realize there's three types of givers? According to verse 7 of chapter 9, the tearful giver, the fearful giver, and the cheerful giver. The fearful giver gives begrudgingly, can hardly part with his money. The, the fearful giver gives out of necessity, out of compulsion, out of a fear of God. Oh, I don't do this. God will curse me. They're working from the wrong end of the equation. There, there's the tearful, fearful, and then there's the cheerful giver who gladly parts with their gift according to God's prosperity because according to verse 8, God's grace enables them to abound in every good work. They give out of grace, uh, a celebration of grace, an experience of grace. Or as someone else put it, if you were to kind of put these three givers, the fearful, tearful, cheerful giver into other categories, some have said that there are three kind of givers in the church, the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything out of a flint, you got to hammer it. To get anything out of a sponge, you got to squeeze it. But the honeycomb just overflows with its own sweetness. We, we need honeycomb givers. We need cheerful Givers, And as we wrap up, I just wrote down a few things that will help you and I to become cheerful givers. Reasons for cheerful giving. Because remember, Acts 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Number one, cheerful giving is something you and I should want because in giving, we become an answer to someone's prayer. Is that not a happy thought? Someone right now on the mission field in our church, somewhere nearby us, a ministry or whatever, is in need, and people in that ministry or people in that situation are praying, and then God moves you to give, and that gift meets the need, and they become happy, and you become happy that they're happy. And you become happy that you're an answer to their prayers. I'll give you another reason, because you're investing in eternity and souls, and someday in heaven, you're going to meet someone who said, thank you for supporting that missionary that brought the gospel to my village for the first time, and I heard the gospel. Number three, you're participating in something big. There's, there's a joy to being part of something big beyond yourself, of feeling that you belong to something marvelous. You know, it's like going to a, a, a sports stadium and watching a game. It's one thing to watch what's going on in the field, but part of the experience, part of the joy of going to a, like a football game is, is the experience of you're part of something big. God willing, Santa coming, I'm going to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> to watch my beloved Buckeyes. And I can tell you, I'm going to love Everything I see, I hope, on the field. But I'll tell you, I'll be there a couple of hours before the game. I'll be mixing it up with some families in our church who are going um, to it also. I'll be meeting with friends. We'll be visiting vendors. We'll be eating hot dogs. We'll be buying some, some shirts. We'll be, you know, just rubbing shoulders with the, what we call the Buckeye Nation. We'll be doing our OH and IO thing. 
Then you'll get into the stadium and you'll look across and half the stadium will be a sea of scarlet and and, and gray and white. There's a joy to it. I love it. Part of something big. See him in the church. That when you give to the church, you're, you're, you're giving to something big. God's missionaries and servants all across the world, you're financing them. Little congregations dotted in villages and in the plains of Africa and the jungles of South America and the cities of Asia. The gospel's going forth with our help. Thrilling. Makes you a cheerful giver. It also, another reason to be a cheerful giver because it helps grow you. It helps mature you. It helps you work out in your life the, the warning that Jesus gives, not to let, you can't love God and love money. And as you work out and manage your finances in a God glorying fine way, the Spirit of God blesses that and, and empowers you. Something joyful about that. It's been well said that giving is God's way, not of raising money, but of raising Christians. Brings pleasure to God, doesn't it? He loves a cheerful giver. I don't know, do you not like to bring pleasure to God? If he loves cheerful givers, then then you'll love being one because it means he finds pleasure in it. Because he sees in your life and my life a reflection of the grace of his son being worked out in gracious giving. As the team comes up, You've heard the, the lines, haven't you, of the, on the hymn, Take my silver on my gold, not a might with I withhold. You've sang it a whole lot of times. Frances Wrigley Havergill. She wrote a song about dedication, consecration. Take my life and let it be. Well, I want to tell you, she lived those lines. Those aren't just, you know, po- poetic flourish. This woman did what she described. In fact, when she was writing that hymn, she also at that time in her life gathered up all her gold and all her silver, all her jewelry, and she packed it off to a missionary society in England as an expression of her love for the gospel. In fact, she said that one of her jewelry boxes was fit for a countess. There was that much silver and gold in it. But she said this, I don't need to tell you that I never packed a box with such pleasure. She happily said, Lord, take my silver and my gold. Not a mite will I withhold. Lord, we thank you for your son, who although rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Well, thank you. He made himself of no reputation. He, he clothed himself in humanity to the degree that, that walking down the street, people didn't realize it was the very Son of God. He set aside his, the independent use of his prerogatives. All the glory, all the rich worship of the angels were all suspended and set aside so that we might be saved and enriched by the grace of God and made the children of God. Oh, God... In the light of that, may we be generous givers. May we be honeycombs that just sweetly exude a spirit of giving out of grace. Help us to remember what the apostles said in those early days, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Lord, we're richer than they were, but I'm not sure we're more powerful. Perhaps prosperity has knit our souls to this old world. We're making contributions, but not sacrifices. We're giving beneath our ability, not according to our ability, because we're living for ourselves. We're living for creaturely comforts. While the work of God lax. We're preachers beg. Where it's giving that's begrudging 
and out of necessity rather than cheerful and free. So continue to work in our hearts through this passage, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.